Hello, North Dakota. Uh, thanks for tuning into our afternoon briefing. Uh, yesterday, we had a, a lighter day because of all the positive news. Uh, today, uh, I'm sad to start off our report, uh, reporting that we've had our fifth death in the state of North Dakota related to COVID-19. Uh, this individual was a male in his 60s from Stark County. Uh, he did have underlying health conditions, uh, acquired COVID-19 through community spread. And our hearts and prayers, of course, go out to his family and friends and all of his loved ones who are dealing with this loss. Uh, we also, uh, and that'll be shown in today's numbers uh, as our fifth deaths, but we've also become aware uh, just in recent hours that there was a second uh, COVID-related death uh, earlier today, uh, but no details are available at this time pending notification of relatives. Uh, so those will be uh, in tomorrow's report. Uh, this will bump up uh, to six tomorrow. But again, our deepest condolences on behalf of the First Lady and myself to family members and friends and communities who've lost uh, a loved one. Uh, we know that uh, <clears throat> that's really what all this has been about, is uh, trying to make decisions uh, pragmatically uh, using data, uh, but leading with our heart uh, to make sure that we're uh, <clears throat> protecting ourselves against this invisible assailant, uh, which is has uh, such a deadly effect on, on elderly and people with underlying underlying uh, health conditions. Uh, and so we, that's why we take our work seriously uh, in terms of what we're doing and why we're weighing every decision carefully. Uh, but as we take a look at the other numbers today, uh, there's also some positive news uh, on that slide, uh, and <clears throat> and that's down in the center, middle center. I want to draw your attention to that, uh, which is 14 hospitalizations. This is uh, the the net. So there's two more discharges. So uh, with the good news is two people that were hospitalized with COVID uh, are are that, so that number's gone down, uh, and I want to say that the <clears throat> for the uh, for those that are worried uh, about, you know, are we prepared enough? The key of all the things that we're doing and what every state is doing is trying to make sure that the sum total of all of the business closures and physical distancing and great hygiene practices, uh, all of the new approaches to how we're conducting business, all of that is done uh, with the goal of preserving to make sure that you have enough hospital capacity to give the highest level of care. Uh, and, and that could mean in a life-threatening situation that you can get somebody into uh, intensive care unit or ICU that you've got those care units available. And so from that standpoint, uh, even though we're saddened by the news of two more deaths, I want North Dakotans to know and understand uh, that with uh, 14 uh, 14 people hospitalized uh, and again continuing to really refine that number but we know that number uh, is uh, in the thousands uh, that we are literally using less than 1% of the hospital capacity today for COVID patients. So that means 99% remains available. And, and so that's what we should focus on because in terms of what we're working on to do, uh, that is absolutely, uh, absolutely positively working. In terms of the, uh, the rolling seven seven day average still at three percent. Uh, that's still in the among the top of all the states in terms of those tested uh, versus those who are becoming positive. So that's uh, fantastic. And then also uh, in terms of recovered, uh, uh, we have a, a a headline on that sense that we've now uh, added three more people to the recovered column, which pushes our total to over 100 uh, that are recovered. On the, when we show that graphically on the next slide, again, on the top of this shows the uh, active cases are above the line. Uh, so that's yesterday's active cases plus uh, the uh, new reported positives and below the line is the recoveds uh, and those people who've passed away. Uh, and again, uh, yesterday we had great news because it was, you see a little dip there where we actually had more recoveds than we had new. Uh, today we had more new than we had recovered. Uh, and so it continues to uh, climb, active cases climb by 14 today. That's the numbers for today. Uh, one uh, thing I wanted, we had Attorney General Wayne Stengem here earlier talking about 
uh, potential scams. Uh, one thing I wanted to alert uh, the state to uh, on Thursday morning, Department of Health was made aware of situation where scammers uh, somewhere uh, in this nation are calling individuals who live out of state. So somehow they're calling North Dakotans that aren't in state. They're saying they're calling from the North Dakota Department of Health and they're asking for sensitive information. Uh, and so again, the scam is preying on, on uh, residents uh, from other states or residents of North Dakota. Uh, that are that are outside of state and again it goes without saying that if someone calls you on the phone as the attorney general said uh, do not provide your medicaid number your social security number your credit card information uh, there's not a chance in the world with our department of health uh, as busy as they are right now that they would be randomly calling citizens and asking them for personal information so our department of health is working both with the attorney general's office and federal partners to address the situation uh, but again and if any of you, if any of you uh, are called uh, by a by a firm that says that they're representing the North Dakota Department of Health, ask you for sensitive information, we'd ask you to report that to the North Dakota Attorney General's office. Uh, uh, we've got many uh, loyal viewers that tune in every day, and and from some of them, we've heard that the thing that's most anticipated is who is going to be the mystery guest uh, that we have every day uh, during our briefing. Uh, and today, we've got a someone who's going to share some thoughts, and, and this individual, like others that have been here, I've got a lot of gratitude uh, for the, what they're doing for the state and the leadership role they're playing. But uh, this is more special uh, than ever, because uh, during this time when we're uh, when we're, you know, I'm going to say isolated from others. I've had, you know, fantastic support. I give a shout out to Joe, Jesse, and Tom uh, it, that, you know, my kids have been a great job of staying in touch and supportive, but uh, the First Lady and I uh, have been hanging out together uh, here in Bismarck. Uh, and as I've said at previous things, seeing a lot of each other, which uh, you can ask her later how she feels about that. She's here live for questions later today, but uh, we're, it's, uh, I just have to say, in addition to her role as First Lady and the role that she's played as a tremendous face and voice, a courageous face and voice of recovery, uh, she's been an amazing, amazing partner. And uh, people ask me about you know the burden of leadership but this is a team sport we all go through the challenges in life uh, when you've got somebody that is really there to support you and I have to say uh, the North Dakota needs to know that uh, that the first lady has been supporting me uh, around the clock uh, in every possible way to make sure that I can stay focused on doing this job 24 hours a day and for her I want to thank her for that so but anyway here we are we've got a, a the incredible, uh, courageous First Lady of North Dakota to hear to talk a little bit about recovery and all the challenges that go on uh, maintaining recovery during periods of isolation. So I know that the press doesn't have to do this, but if you're listening at home, give it up for the First Lady of North Dakota. Here she is. And unlike other speakers that I have to stay six feet away from, we are, we're cohabitating so we can, we can be by each other. It's the first time you've seen me within six feet of anybody in a long time. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Governor, and thank you to your team for your unprecedented leadership during this time in North Dakota. These are truly challenging times. You know, we can all feel some level of anxiety and, and worry. But, you know, it's especially difficult for those struggling with behavioral health challenges, either mental illness or addiction. As someone who's been in recovery for over 18 years, you know, I understand how critical connection is during this time. You know, one of the major aspects of recovery from addiction is connection and relationships. And during this time of social distancing, it's really easy to feel alone and isolated. But, you know, we can all play a role in our own behavioral health while looking out for those that are most vulnerable in our communities. So my suggestion to everyone is to reach out to those that you know who may not or who may be struggling um, with these issues of behavioral health. Reach out to them through social media. You know, if you have FaceTime, FaceTime someone, write them a note. Um, just reach out and connect. It's more critical now than, than ever. 
You know, you can share gratitude, empathy, and compassion um, with people. And during this time, it can make a huge difference for someone who's struggling. There are also support and resources available that can help. Now, I always say that we have one of the most proactive and innovative behavioral health teams across our nation, and they've been working really hard to ensure that we have resources available for those that are struggling during this time. You can check out their resources online at behavioralhealth.nd.gov slash COVID. But on this site, you're going to find a lot of different resources, including how to find virtual recovery support meetings. You can also talk to somebody who's been there through the Recovery Talk phone line that is covered 24 hours a day, seven days a week by peer support specialists. And these people are people that have lived experience with both mental illness and addiction. So I encourage you to reach out and call that line if you're struggling, if you're wondering, if you um, have questions. You know, there's a lot more people these days that are, you know, leaning on um, substances to try to get through this time. And some people are probably questioning um, whether they need help or not and you can you can reach out to these people at recovery at recovery talk to ask those questions so i encourage you to do that and the number is 1-844-44-TALK-2 there's also a great program called parents lead uh, through our behavioral health uh, team and and that is a great resource for talking to young people and children um, and supporting them uh, with their behavioral health during this time you can also find resources for addiction and mental health at this behavioral health website. And you can find a lot of those same resources, resources at recoveryreinvented.com slash COVID, along with many, many other recovery, uh, virtual recovery support services and apps uh, that are available. Uh, so I encourage you to go to recoveryreinvented.com also. So remember that we're all in this together. And the most important thing that, that I can do, that we can all do, is to reach out to people that we know that might be struggling, or maybe even just people you haven't talked to in a long time, to make a connection. Social distancing does not mean social disconnection. I believe that's something the governor has, has mentioned in the past. And in our world of technology, there's an app for everything, and so it's so much easier to stay connected. So... I am uh, so grateful to live in a state full of caring and committed people who are ready to come together to fight this virus like we've come together through so many other challenges before. Thank you. Anything else I need to say? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Stick around for uh, questions. Wise words from uh, the First Lady who's been there. I just want to add a couple more things from the, from the Department of Behavioral Health. Uh, we're doing a great job. One of the things we know, uh, and there's even been reports we've had always, uh, in any uh, given year, uh, there's a risk of overdose uh, with the uh, spread of uh, opioid narcotics. Uh, around the country that was uh, certainly been in the news and here in North Dakota uh, we had nearly 80 overdose deaths a couple of years ago in the state I think 77 was the exact number uh, and and so this is a something that is certainly people are at risk uh, for this we do uh, have Narcan which is something that can be administered you don't have to be a first responder this can be administered by a family member uh, at the very first and subsequent uh, following uh, second and third recovery reinvented, re reinvented events that we held uh, in North Dakota. Uh, we did training for the entire audience, issued Narcan to those who wanted it. There have been cases where uh, parents have uh, saved children and others have used Narcan to resuscitate uh, individuals who might have died but were, were saved because of that fast action. And uh, there is uh, at our behavioralhealth.nd.gov slash opioids, uh, resources there about how to identify the signs of an overdose, steps to take to save a lice, and identifying those who are at risk. Uh, 
and to also learn about the Good Samaritan and Naloxone administration laws because a good, the Good Samaritan laws that exist in North Dakota is if you're with someone and they overdose, uh, you can call and report that. Call 911, report it to the uh, whoever comes first, fire department, police, first responders, ambulance, uh, and under those Good Samaritan laws, you won't be prosecuted for drug use. Uh, at the, for related to that incident. So again, save a life uh, and learn learn all these signs. But if you want to get Narcan or Naloxone uh, free two-dose kit, uh, you can get that again at the uh, DHS uh, Behavioral Health Division website, dhsbhd at nd.gov or call 701-328-8920. Uh, if you go to that website, the training is embedded. There's a short video that you need to watch. You fill out a form. Uh, you say you include the fact that you're over 18, uh, and then they will uh, give you a location where you can pick it up because they're not able to, to ship it. Uh, and again, for those uh, that are wondering how that Narcon gets paid for, that's part of the federal uh, opioid grants that the uh, current White House administration passed uh, in recent years to support states uh, in fighting uh, in fighting that uh, that death, the death related to opioid and other overdoses. Uh, next uh, topic is census. Again, we've uh, talked about this. That census time is right now. You can fill it out my2020census.gov. Uh, but the this is there's no uh, there was no March Madness, but we have a competition going between North Dakota and all the other states on who can do the best in terms of filling out their their. Uh, their forms and then they, they because this is the census bureau and they do have the data they actually have what cities are leading uh and because uh in part because mark staples one of our great team members is from harwood north dakota as is jody hansen uh, from the governor's staff uh, i'm happy to report that harwood north dakota is ranked seventh in highest response rate as of yesterday in the United States, of all cities in the United States, Harwood is number seven. 76.9% uh, of households responding. Uh, there's four other North Dakota cities, so five of the top 50 cities in the United States are from North Dakota. Argusville uh, at 74.4%, tied for 18th place. Uh, <clears throat> uh, North River, uh, Frontier, North Dakota, and Riley's Acres, uh, three locations uh, that are in the extraterritorial zone of Fargo uh, are in the 22nd, 25th, and 39th place, respectively, but all with more than 70% of their forms already in. The top county in the state of North Dakota, Drum roll goes to Burley County, tied for 61st place uh, among counties in the United States with 58.9%. Uh, and North Dakota, however, as a whole, we got some work to do. We just snuck into the top half for 24th out of 50 states uh, right now. So get out there on my2020census.gov and fill it out. Uh, if you have not yet received, because you can do this uh, on paper, uh, you can do it online, but if you're saying, I didn't get anything in the mail, if you're someone who got your mail through the P.O. box, then typically uh, a census person would have knocked on your door and delivered it because they have uh, not doing door-to-door -door, uh, work right now during the COVID crisis. The Census Bureau has announced that they will mail form to every household, including those that receive their mail at a post office box. So if you're 10% of North Dakotans who get your mail at a post office box, look for your census form, fill it out, send it back, or go online and fill it out. Remember that every person counts, uh, and with federal support dollars over the next decade, it's estimated to be $19,100 per person for everybody that counts. That adds up quickly, so thank you for that. Unemployment, the stats uh, yesterday, uh, 1,562 unemployment claims, bringing the total to 43900 and 24. Uh, and again, for those that are self-employed independent contractors or gig workers under the pandem pandemic unemployment assistant claims. So again, we've had people say, hey, I'm not sure I qualify for unemployment. If you don't qualify for unemployment, uh, traditionally, you likely do qualify under the pandemic unemployment assistance. Uh, also, uh, go to uh, ndjobs.com, North Dakota Job Service. Uh, but those claims uh, 3,642 uh, have been uh, been filed. Uh, so there's uh, also another 
program called the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Claims. Uh, 530, though, 538 came in yesterday. That's, that is a separate category of 3,454. So that is great, uh, great things happening there. And again, thanks to our job service team that's dealing with this incredible crush of, of, uh, of activity. As a reminder, uh, two days ago, we launched the CARE 19 app. Uh, that is uh, off and running. Uh, there have been 13,467 downloads. Uh, we believe that other states uh, may be coming online soon. Uh, the Android app uh, is uh, going to be submitted this weekend for submission, so hopefully that will be available next week. Uh, but in terms of the uh, medical app category on the Apple Store, it's in 11th place, uh, which is uh, uh, fantastic. And when you think about the entire App Store, there's 1.8 million apps out there in case you uh, are sitting at home and want to add more apps. Uh, the one we'd like you to app is, add is the CARE 19 app to help us do contact tracing to help save lives. Uh, relative to uh, shopping practices, uh, one of the things that we've talked about, again, uh, we know that uh, the business closures, we extended those uh, before to April 20th. Uh, we said that by next week, Wednesday, we'd provide an update by April 15th. Uh, but many businesses that are essential do remain open, especially grocery stores, supermarket, big box stores with grocery services. Uh, but we're still hearing from people uh, that, hey, when I go to this place, it's you know really crowded and people are not practicing social distancing. Uh, and others might say, hey, we need more uh, we need more protection. So again, uh, there are many stores that we're aware of and been in, and been in contact with. I know that uh, uh, Brent S Sanford, Lieutenant Governor, had a conversation uh, with the leaders of Hornbachers today. Uh, many stores are in the process of self-implementing uh, the mask requirement to help protect their employees. And again, uh, when you're uh, in the stores, you can practice the courtesy of staying uh, away from others. Uh, but again, the North Dakota Grocers Association is recommended for the health of themselves and all of those store workers to limit your trips to once a week, limit family members going on that trip uh, to one person. These are not social outings. Utilize hand washing facilities before and after or hand sanitizer stations when available. would recommend you might wear a mask if you're going into that kind of crowded situation, uh, maintaining that separation. And again, uh, avoid the social gatherings. Plan your shopping list prior, and if available, use online shopping for delivery or store pickup. Again, this is not uh, you know the time at all to be complacent. We talk about this at every time we have one of these about being North Dakota smart, about staying home unless absolutely necessary, uh, stay healthy, stay connected. Uh, we are taking smart targeted action to slow the spread spread of this uh, deadly disease, uh, and we believe that that is all still working. But we need everybody uh, to do their part with individual responsibility. Uh, again, avoiding discretionary travel. No groups of more than ten. Uh, follow the directions of your state and local authorities. And again, remember why we're doing this. We're doing this for the 20% of North Dakotans who are most vulnerable. Uh, and again, uh, as it relates to those uh, that we know are in long-term care or assisted living or skilled nursing facilities around the state, especially, we want to give a shout out to you for your, your courage because we know that it's a hardship to not have uh, visitors, having family members, grandkids there uh, to visit you right now, but know uh, that everything we're put in place is in an effort to try to protect you. And I'm sure you know, and they've let you know that you're all deeply loved. And we want to thank all those caregivers and workers that are working in those facilities uh, who continue to do work every day to protect, uh, the, protect the elders in our society. We appreciate that. Okay, with that, we're going to stand for questions. We've got the uh, as always, uh, our state health officer, Mylan Tufty, is here, and uh, First Lady and myself. Okay, Jeremy. Um, you said sort of repeatedly that um, you would consider ordering more stringent restrictions when and if it makes sense, whether that's a stay-at-home order or something else. Um, I'm wondering what exactly are those when and if conditions? Well, one of the big ones that we're trying to really zero in on is uh, one which we've been highlighting this week, which is hospital capacity. Because again, if you take a look at every other state and understand, you know, it, without a vaccine and without uh, 
the you know proven therapeutics. There are ideas out there about therapeutics, but again, there's no quote cure for this virus. And without that, then the way you save lives is preserving hospital capacity. And the way you preserve hospital capacity is you keep those that curve flattened and below that. And at a point where we're using 14 beds out of thousands of beds in North Dakota, uh, we've got a lot of capacity. And and it, again, it at it, it the, the strategy is not who can put in the most number of orders uh, with the loftiest titles. Uh, it's the, the goal is, is how do you actually slow transmission? But without a cure, if you, if you locked everything down and then everybody came back out again three months later, the coronavirus could still be here and we, we, we could have our peak uh, then. So the, the keeping the curve below the healthcare is the right way, is the right approach uh, to doing this thing. Uh, but as there is uh, some spread, particularly you know, among healthier, younger, whatever, that's again how you start building up some herd immunity. And that is one of the people say, well, how do you get back to work on this? Part of the way you get back to work is, is in populations where enough people have been exposed to it, where their body, where they've built up uh, antibodies uh, to it. And so there is a, uh, they lock it down in extreme and then you try to open it back up. You, you're, you're just deferring when you have your spike. So we're trying to manage uh, something that right now there's not a cure to, and, and one of the key indicators is hospital capacity, and in that we're in great shape. So that wouldn't indicate that we need to do any more locking down right now. What it, what we do need to do is do uh, a even stronger and better job of contact tracing, which is why the CARE 19 app, which is why we've ramped up our, our, our contact tracing teams and why we're being uh, very thorough when we have a positive find that positive, find out who they've been in contact with and why we put out the order on Monday that if you're a household uh, resident living with someone who's a positive, you're also quarantined. That's the way that we can we can stop the spread. And again, you're looking at another number we look at is our rolling, you know, seven day average on percent positives. And we're, you know, continue to tick along plus or minus around that 3%, which is again, among the best in the nation. So if you're in the best in the nation in terms of most available hospital capacity and best in the nation in terms of of the uh, in, in terms of the written number percentage of positives of the tests that you're taking and you're also among the states that are doing the most testing per capita uh, then those would be indicators that say what we're doing is appropriate it's pragmatic uh, it's targeted uh, and it's and it's working okay we'll go Dave and then over here to this side, and then Jacob. Because we've talked a lot about contract tracing and the people who are working on it. How big is your team working on contact tracing? Well, originally, you know, when you're, when you're not having a pandemic, uh, that group is less than 10 within the Department of Health. Uh, the report I got, I guess, about 36 hours ago was that we had trained over 250 people. Uh, we had talked, I think, one time here. I said we need to have order magnitude. That would mean 10 to 100. Turns out that we might be going to two orders of magnitude. I mean, we might be going from 10 to 100, then 100 to 1,000. I mean, if we can get people trained up. We were talking to all the, the tribes about their tribes standing up their own contact tracing teams in tribal areas. Uh, and, and again, we've got training that's in place. And uh, other states have have actually even taken other state employees that had investigative backgrounds, whether that was, you know, traffic or, you know, alcohol or fraud or uh, auditors team people, Vermont's one of those, and they took everybody that did investigative work and they said, you're all in charge of a contact tracing team. We haven't gone that far yet, but we are, uh, we are making steady progress on ramping up our, our capability. And again, part of it with the CARE 19 is we're trying to bring some automated data collection to that to that practice, because this is one of these things where you guys, have heard, people have heard me talk for years about if you, you manually collect the data, which means, uh, you know, a state employee on a phone talking to a person and they, they talk uh, to that first positive, that can take 60 to 90 minutes to do the whole interview. And they might identify, and the average I've seen on the, the average number of people that they identify as having close contact with is, is six people. But we have had some cases where uh, people that were, you know, in a business where there was a lot of contact, uh, we've had to make as many as 75 calls 
to people that may have been in contact with that one person. So it's very, very manual, very time consuming, uh, very paper driven process right now. And so we're also trying to stand up IT systems to support this contact tracing capability, uh, like a, a contact relationship manager software, and then also, uh, again, more capacity, more just more bodies with better systems, plus with the, the IT app. The reason why we're doing all this is not because like in two weeks we can stop doing this. If we want to put this state and nation back to work, we're going to have to be really good at contact tracing going forward because we could be six months from now and you could have a, a, a hotspot flare up. And when that hotspot flares up, we don't want to shut the whole state down. You know, we want to isolate those people that tested positive, isolate those people they were in close contact with. And the way we identify that with is, is really great contact tracing skills. So this is uh, you know, new words, new approaches, but when you don't have a cure, this is one of the ways you can contain uh, a, a highly contagious and deadly virus. Online. Dustin Moore with KTGO at the flag in Tioga. Around the Lake Sakakalia area, there's some concern that people aren't following, following social distancing on and around the lake. With summer coming, has there been any discussions or concerns around the number of people congregating around our lakes areas? The answer is yes. There's been a lot of talk about this, and uh, we're in communication uh, just even yesterday with uh, uh, Game and Fish uh, and Parks. You know, Parks and Rec. We're in constant communication with them, and as we've said before, uh, you know, right now. Uh, in the early part of the season uh, for fishing and recreation uh, in some places in the state, we don't even have the ice out on the lakes yet. So looking ahead, of course, we hope we're in a different situation by the summer, but if we're not, uh, it, it's either gonna be a combination of, of uh, if it's, if we're really, in, if, if we find our peak has moved or there's something moved this summer and we've got to do state orders, that's always a tool, but we'd love to do, again, use the rifle, not the shotgun. So as we've said, even right now for people that are out there, if there's crowds on boat ramps or uh, people standing too close together on, fish, on fishing bridges, instead of closing the whole season for the whole state, we'll close the bridge, we'll close the boat ramp uh, and try to bring targeted action to those people that aren't following the rules uh, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to try to shut down every one of the over 400 lakes in North Dakota that are great game and fish stocks uh, with fish. So that's, that's the approach. But yeah, uh, you know, I know there's a hashtag out save the summer. We'd love to save the summer. One way to save the summer is for us to make sure that we uh, get through uh, April uh, with the con con continuing the kind of results we have right now. I think Jacob and then, or, and then Lane, well, Lane, you were next. Okay, Jacob, then Lane. Uh, this might be a question more for uh, Ms. Mylan Tufty. Um, in regards, we, we've been seeing reports of states uh, having their deaths by COVID-19 risen, and it's basically coming down to a question of, did they die of COVID-19 or did they die with COVID-19? Are there tests being done or ways to confirm that the five or six deaths that we've had in North Dakota were caused by the coronavirus or caused by, or, or were they possibly recovered afterwards and then passed away? And so there's a lot of discussion about COVID related deaths and there are individuals that do die from their illness and they are hospitalized and we know that they've tested positive and it's a, a by product of their illness, but they do have um, other comorbidities as the, the governor has been talking about. So there's a growing body of evidence around, is it truly related to COVID or is it COVID related? And so we are doing um, education and looking at the, the science around that. There are individuals that have passed away and do get tested for COVID. Um, and we are resulting those as well and trying to understand what exactly is happening for these fatalities. fatalities. Wayne? There's a new test going around. It's a blood test to see if people have developed an immunity to uh, the coronavirus. Has North Dakota looked into doing these blood tests? And if so, could that be a way to reopen businesses if a lot of people are testing well? Yes, I uh, had a chance to talk on Tuesday night uh, to the chairman of Abbott. Uh, it's one of the companies that's producing these. Uh, these would be high volume, low cost, millions and millions of tests. 
uh, that could be created. Uh, you do a little finger prick on the end of your finger, you put it on a, a, a tab, uh, and it gives you a sort of a plus or minus uh, pretty quickly that can identify uh, whether you've had those antibodies. These, I think, are going to be, when I talk about the new normal, I think these are the kinds of tests that are going to be required and have to be from many companies in super high volumes uh, to try to figure out a way uh, for, in particular, like who may, if you have a factory, it'd be great if you could put everybody back into that factory, someone who is, uh, or, you know, or pick any workplace where it's challenging to maintain physical separation, but where you could put workers back uh, in, into a uh, into a physical space where they uh, know that everybody else that's in there has also uh, had it and built up antibodies to it. I mean, that would be fantastic. So, so you're, we're going to see a lot of that coming. Uh, right now, uh, they're not readily available on the market. Uh, some of the initial production that has uh, come has actually gone uh, gone to Europe because of the uh, they're again ahead of us in the curve. Uh, but we know that there are you know, dozens of companies around the world that are trying to develop these these tests. Uh, and, and these tests are not as high acuity as the ones that we have right now. Uh, best science is that they think that they'd be about 90% accurate. Uh, and, you know, it'd be great if they could be much higher than that. But even at that, you could screen uh, with a 90% accuracy. And then if you've got people that maybe get a false positive, uh, you test them again uh, with a, and you save your testing resources because you're doing the mass screening uh, with a large volume. Uh, but we're going to see all of that, all that coming, but not here today, not, not available in North Dakota today. Amy? All right, I have a question for um, both you and the First Lady. Um, I have to imagine that the past few weeks have just been incredibly stressful for the both of you. Um, can you guys talk about what each of you do to try to stay calm and stay connected? <laughs> well, um, you know, I would say for me, it's uh, my life is pretty busy before uh, this um, situation. So um, having the opportunity to spend time at home has been has been great and for us to spend time together um but i've been uh, i've had a lot of projects you know that i haven't been able to work on or haven't chosen to prioritize so um it's been good to do that um you know it's been more time for meditating more time for yoga um uh you know also kind of fooling around with du Duolingo to, uh, I have this goal to learn, you know, French and Spanish, but, you know, I, I should just pick one overachiever. So anyway, um, but that's, you know, kind of, kind of that, you know, and just, uh, we have a, also have a service pet, uh, at our home named Mr. Gray, our cat. So that's super helpful also. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gray came with a marriage. He's, uh, <laughs> about, I don't know, 100 years old, and he's in hospice, basically, so we're taking care of an aging cat. But, and his full name is Mysterious Mr. Gray, if you want to get that right in the press, because he's often difficult to find, including yesterday when she couldn't find him for quite a while. He's always got a new hiding place. But yeah, in terms of things to do, I'd say one of the things that I think that is, if, in terms of supporting each other during a time of stress, one of the uh, little secrets I'll share is that uh, Catherine writes really wonderful supportive notes and puts them on the mirror. Uh, so if I'm working until midnight and I come home and, uh, and maybe our clocks aren't on the same schedule, then there's a little note there. So it's a, uh, that's super, super thoughtful. And then sometimes when she gets up, there's one back for her because she might, I might be working later and she might be getting up earlier, uh, just the way our schedules uh, work. Uh, but yeah, I'd say, uh, yeah, supporting each other uh, and staying curious. And I'd say the other thing we're doing a good job is we generally stay off social media. That's another way to maintain sanity. There's a lot of uh, a lot of noise out there, not a lot of signal, and I think that we're really trying to go through this by really focusing on the signal. And and I think that uh, gratitude is something that both of us are practicing uh, every day, morning and noon and night. And I think that gratitude, of course, gives you resilience. And there's a lot to be grateful for when you're when you're living in North Dakota. And there's a lot to be grateful for when we have an opportunity to serve the people of North Dakota. Thank you for that question. Jacob? I also have a question for the First Lady. Perfect. <laughs> uh, 
Yesterday, the governor said, the more exposure I get from the first lady, the better. So we'll just say that's a good thing. Maybe that came off wrong. I don't know. This is the most amount of time she's ever had to spend time with me in her whole life, too. <laughs> Wondering if you could corroborate and respond. Well, the first thing I was thinking was TMI when I heard that, when I was out at work, out walking. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, we have a great relationship. I think we're super lucky, you know, that we, uh, uh, you know, we just are completely compatible and have a great relationship. And, you know, we're so supportive of each other. And we both spend a lot of time in gratitude. And so, um, I, again, I, I just uh, echo what he said that, never thought that this would be what I'd be doing with my life. And um, I'm grateful I'm on this journey with him and, um, and grateful for the opportunity to be in this role, so. Dave? This is also important, <laughs> but it has to do with a conversation that I had yesterday with Dr. Etherington at the state hospital. And she said they, they've seen demand for behavioral health services drop because of COVID-19. They're not getting any walk-ins. Are you concerned that COVID-19 might be scaring people away because they, they're afraid that if they seek help, they might catch it from somebody? Um, that's, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I think maybe people aren't, uh, I know people are reaching out to our behavioral health team um, and the resources there, um, those, uh, that's they're in higher demand than they typically are um, and I think I'm on the board of Hazel and Betty Ford and um, we've had a couple board meetings and they they're uh, the people connecting with them has actually increased because they have a lot of virtual services virtual intensive outpatient services um, but they you know I, th I would assume all treatment centers and resources are working really hard to prevent people from, you know, contracting COVID while they're there. But, you know, there's a lot of virtual services out there available for people to, um, if they're afraid to go to a location and seek help. Uh, so many uh, treatment centers offer that, including, I, I believe, Hartview here in Bismarck. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think the resource, the connections that people are making to resources we have at the state are, are definitely increased. Um, the calls that we have and, and people reaching out for things like Parents Lead. So, um, but I, um, you know, it's certainly a time where more people could be reaching out, and I hope they do, and I hope they're not limited because of uh, the stigma that can be associated with it also. Uh, going off of that, uh, in relation to being able to connect with those resources, during this pandemic, is there enough staffing, is there enough infrastructure in place to make those virtual telehealth services as effective as in person? Well, at least, um, again, uh, my experience is a lot related to Hazelden Betty Ford, and um, what I know is that they are redirecting a lot of their staffing to um, focus on uh, whether it's providing uh, resources with educational resources or um, because of, uh, some of the uh, virtual outpatient treatment, you have to be licensed addiction counselors. But I believe that um, they are, uh, you know, um, focusing on redirecting and trying to have more people focused on the virtual opportunities that they have available. I was just going to say with the First Lady here, this will probably be our highest rated show yet, and that's great. I'm glad you guys are asking her lots of questions, so thank you, all of you. Um, Governor, you said some of the more popular online modeling that's out there is not particularly accurate as far as North Dakota is concerned, and that the state is sort of developing its own model. I'm wondering if you could tell me when that will be rolled out and what factors it will um, sort of adjust for. Well, first of all, uh, again, thanks for the question. I want to make sure that uh, we are having a problem, and we're having a problem that the IHME model, uh, which gets a lot of national attention, which was revised, it was in the news last night because it substantially lowered uh, the number of deaths in the United States, uh, I think down into the some 60,000 some. Uh, North Dakota at the same time went up by about a factor of four. I mean, I think on Sunday we were at 118 and now on the IHME model we're over 600. Uh, there, there is, we've identified the data errors that are in there. We've reported them uh, to IMHE. We've made contacts with the uh, senior folks that are there. Our understanding uh, feedback has been there, busy trying to import and update 
models uh, using European data. They're trying to update their models for uh, Africa and the rest of the world where the, it's still coming. And uh, um, you know, imagine a, North Dakota's not apparently on their high on their priority list right now. Uh, but I would just ask that everybody completely disregard that. It, it's causing some issues because there is some national press that's referring to it, and they're trying to link it back uh, to, to North Dakota. Uh, I think in you know by comparison, it might even you know show that. Uh, the other states that have, you know, five to eight times more population might have fewer deaths in their model than North Dakota, and there's just doesn't even make sense. It's not tracking, and it's already got bad data that, you know, days when we had zero, it had 17, 17 deaths. So just ignore that one. Uh, the other one to ignore is the Act Now model. That's another one that's out there that is not reflective of current conditions or decisions. So there's a number which had a lot, they had a lot of popularity, got a lot of traction. Uh, you know, a week or two ago, but they're not reflective of the data. So we continue to work uh, with our models. We did have a modeling of the team that's working on modeling uh, is having a discussion with uh, Wyoming, South Dakota, <clears throat> and uh, Montana. So we're continuing to have that discussion. Uh, there are healthcare groups, <clears throat> regional groups like Sanford that have developed models. I know we've got a meeting set up uh, on Saturday to talk to, with Sanford about their model. Uh, and in the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the key projection, the thing you do with the model is trying to figure out where the peak is. And what the, why that matters is because then whether or not you've got enough hospital capacity. So the model feeds your hospital surge planning. So I don't have a great sense of urgency right now to drive uh, and get out with a model. Um, other states, you know, used models to drive their stay-at-home orders weeks ago, right? There was... Uh, States that you know that had ranges of deaths, uh, you know, nearby us that said that 36 to 76 thousand people might die in that state, uh, and now that's the number less than the whole U.S. Uh, I'm just saying again, we have been cautious about trying to you know, we understanding how statistical modeling works and how off it can be if the variables are bad. We haven't wanted to drive. Uh, we don't make decisions on data versus decisions on flawed forecasts. And, and so we, the real data we have is like how many beds we're using right now in our hospitals and how many we have. That's something that we can really look at today and make a decision on. So the forecasts are one factor, but it's, you'd want to have multiple, uh, multiple models and then you'd want to use them as inputs, but you would never want to uh, trust them because there's so much uncertainty. And part of the uncertainty is what's the rate of spread and the rate of spread based on, based on human behavior. And there's no one's been able to really predict uh, human behavior, even with small groups, much less entire populations. So I, I am, you know, we're going to continue to work on models, but the, the models that we, that we're, we would work on would be trying to figure out, would we ever, ever, ever need to get into that tier three, uh, minimal care facilities, sort of the uh, the ones where you've got cots in a gymnasium kind of thing. And our goal is to make sure that we're taking the actions that keep our citizens out of that. That's not where we want to be caring for people in our state. So I, I feel like we're on the right path. I don't feel the sense of urgency about uh, releasing one model because that's not even the goal. The goal is to keep getting inputs that drive us towards success. And they're one, they're one of the inputs. But boy, you can all see right now that uh, even really sophisticated models can have really flawed outcomes like the IHME one uh, if you don't have the right data going into it. Online then, Jacob. This one has come in a couple times. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz has disagreed that North Dakota residents with lake property in Minnesota should be traveling back and forth this summer. Uh, have you spoken to him about this and um, what are your thoughts on this issue? Well, I've got a call with the Governor Walsh at five o'clock today and it should be one of a number of things we talk about. Uh, I think that that was, uh, came from a news report uh, which was quoting something that I hadn't said. Uh, and so we're going to track that down uh, to try to find out uh, that. But again, this is why even at the governor level, we, I like to talk to people, not through the press to talk to others. He's a neighbor and he's uh, making all the smart decisions to lead his state. And one of the things that Governor Walsh and I both know is that uh, when it comes to the Northwestern Minnesota and the you know eight to 10 counties in Northwestern Minnesota that all receive their primary health care from hospitals in, uh, you know, in Fargo or Grand Forks, or the people in 
you know, the Wapton area that receive their care in Breckenridge, we've got integrated healthcare systems that work on both sides of the border. And so, as I've said that, you know, any, when it comes down to, uh, there, there's no concept of quote, closing the border between North Dakota and Minnesota that makes any sense because, uh, you know, what we're, you know, you're not gonna have someone, you know, cross over uh, from Fargo to go to Walgreens to get their prescription. Uh, because that's where they get their prescription, or you're not going to have a nurse in East Grand Forks, uh, you know, go to work at Altru. So there's just some very common sense things that we got to make sure that we're we're working through on that. And particularly, uh, North Dakota healthcare, we're going to continue to serve citizens of Minnesota uh, if their primary provider has been affiliated with Altru or Sanford and Grand Forks or Fargo. Uh, you know, our borders are open, and we're going to continue to serve those people. And and so we've got to figure out a way. These are in, you know, it's an integrated community that's divided by. Uh, a shared river and, and by a border, but we've got to make sure that our policies line up uh, to, to make sure that. And then the topic of, uh, you know, Minnesotans may be worried about North Dakotans coming over. Uh, we've got a lot of people around Devil's Lake that are worried about Minnesotans coming over to catch their walleye up there at Devil's Lake. Uh, you know, so it's this in-state, out-of-state thing. And, and during a time of crisis, uh, we start getting labels for us and them. Uh, and we have to think about it more as we, because we, when we say we, we're in it together, uh, that means North Dakotans, Minnesotans, South Dakotans, I mean, I mean, Montans, all of our neighbors, we're all in it together and we got to continue to work together as I'm sure Governor Waltz and I have worked productively on a number of other things, including the diversion. Uh, we've had productive call earlier about the, the COVID crisis and I'm sure we'll have a good call today. Jacob, then Lane. Uh, going back to your dislike for the IHME model, as much as uh, you have a problem with these models, a lot of people enjoy numbers. It helps them find confidence or at least help prepare in times of uncertainty. You said you don't have an urgency to release your own model, but people like numbers. It helps them prepare, and you have mentioned your love for statistics in high school. If you weren't the governor, wouldn't you be interested in seeing what kind of models or what kind of data the state was making decisions off of? Well, I think we've tried to be really transparent. We've also had feedback that has said, said, oh my goodness, you know, the first five minutes of your presentation is all numbers every day. Uh, and, you know, could you stop burying us with numbers? So we get, we get both sides, too many numbers, not enough numbers. Uh, we hear both sides. And, and I'd say the, and I want to make clear on your question, I like the IHME model, a matter of fact, is it was our favorite uh, when we understood how it was being built and how it was being delivered. Uh, we just don't like it when it's got the wrong data for our state in it. Uh, I'd be really interested to seeing what the, what the model says uh, if they actually had our actual data in there reflecting the restrictive travel we've put in, the closure of non-essential businesses, uh, and the actual uh, you know death and hospitalization rates. I mean, I'd be really interested in it. But So we'll keep working with them constructively to see if we can get an updated and we'll let you guys know if we actually get an updated version of that that reflects the real, the real case. But uh, yeah, I get that people are, you know, people are curious. They want to, you know, get inside your head and figure out, you know, how you make judgments. And and in the end of the day, in this job, uh, the job is to lead, and you have to take all the inputs that you get from lots of sources, and then you have to make a decision that you think is best for the for the people of North Dakota. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we'll keep uh, doing. And we've tried through you know, through all the daily availability to help people understand how we're thinking about the problem. Problem, how we're measuring our goal against the problem and how we're work, working against it. So we'll, we'll keep keep doing that so people, so it shouldn't be a mystery. People should know uh, how their leaders are thinking about the problem and we'll continue to focus on transparency. I, I'm sorry, Governor, you said that we should ignore that model, but you just said you like it. Well, I, I like the people that are working on it. I like their methodology and you can like a model but you can very much dislike the fact that they've entered the wrong data into the model. I mean, they have inaccurate data for North Dakota right now, so then the whole projection is false right now. Like I said, we'd, we'll, and we'll keep working with them to see if we can get our real data showing back up in that model. Governor, we've had a few viewers that receive a supplemental security income, and they were wondering if they fall under the CARE Act to receive that stimulus check. Uh, that's a... Excellent question that I don't know the answer to, but we'll get back to you on that one. I'm sure I see my team writing it down right now, but thank you for that. Gene Shemp with Hometown Radio Group in Minot and Botno. Uh, when will the rapid test you use for surveillance testing become widely available in Minot and other testing centers, and will there be additional surveillance testing in our larger cities? Uh, 
there's maybe two, two elements in that question. When we take the, the rapid tests, uh, the rapid tests he's likely talking about in that question, again, not here in person to be able to clarify, but is the Abbott ID Now machines. These are these small portable machines that can do a test in five minutes if it's, uh, if it's positive and 13 minutes if it's negative. It keeps chugging along and keeps recycling to make sure it's negative. Uh, so you could do you know four to five an hour uh, with one of those machines. The the federal government bought up all the stock of the Abbott ID Now machines. They're sending 15 to each state. So we could uh, you know go into a a situation where if you had those machines at four or five an hour times 15 machines, you could go into a place and with an hour test say 60 people. Within two hours, you could test 120. This could be a great tool to have as part of a uh, rapid strike team, uh, whether it would be to, if there was a outbreak or a, a nursing home outbreak, uh, where you could come in and do a lot of testing really quickly and then know who to isolate. Because it's a very high acuity test, even though it's rapid, it's uh, as much as six times more accurate than some of the other tests in terms of the amount of, and it takes very little viral load to be able to to be able to work. So those things are really coveted. That's those machines. That's why there's none left. The federal government bought all 1,200 of them that were left. 750 are coming to the states. Thankfully, 15 per each state. So we get 15 just like other states. And then 450 that are coming to uh, the IHS or the Indian Health Service. Because the Indian Health Service had been an Abbott customer and had ID machines and we had contacted Abbott over two and a half weeks ago, we got a list, said, are there any of these machines in our state? There were 22 of them in our state. Uh, Five of them were at MHA. Uh, others were at other Indian Health Service locations. Uh, but there are some of those. Those need to be upgraded uh, the, so that they can not just do a strep test, but they could do a COVID-19 test. And I believe that uh, that's all in progress. I know that uh, General Dorman's been in touch with the president of Abbott, and those upgrades are coming for those machines. And uh, we'll, and that'll be so they'll have 22 of them around the state. We'll have 15 that the state can use. Uh, as part of that. Will we do more testing uh, like we did in uh, in Slope County and in uh, in Gladstone this last weekend? The answer is yes. Uh, we want to make sure we continue to have the capacity to move that testing around. And one of the things that's planned uh, is, again, because we, you know, we know that in uh, Montreal County has showed up as one of the areas where we have the highest number of tests per capita. So there is a planned uh, effort uh, in the coming days uh, to do uh, more concentrated testing in Montreal County. And to clarify, Jean was uh, asking about the saliva testing. Uh, well, the, the saliva testing, uh, and again, not clear, when the tests we did in Slope County and in Gladstone this weekend were a mouth swab, not a nasal swab. If I, Mylynn was uh, out there on site, all geared up with her personal protective gear uh, on Sunday, uh, but she's nodding yes that that was a mouth swab at those locations, which is... Oral pharyngeal swab, so it's a deep probe into the back of your throat. Okay. Wow, can everybody hear that deep probe into the back of your mouth? So that was a, uh, that's not quite like a mouth swab. So that is a, but it's better than, than going up your nose on the, with the pharyngeal word, which you can look up and learn how to spell. But that, but the issue with going up the nose for those tests was almost very frequently when that test was taken, the, the patient would or the person getting the test would sneeze, uh, which would require a complete change out in PPE gear. And the, uh, the oral swab uh, generally doesn't uh, result that. So we're saving, saving a lot of PPE and protecting uh, our workers with uh, we've being able to switch from three weeks ago to the, from the, the nose to the mouth swab. Thank you. Just one more on modeling. Um, you said a few minutes ago you'd like to make decisions on data rather than flawed forecasts. Are you saying that there are no forecasts in your calculus right now at this point? No, I'm not saying that. So what are the forecasts? Uh, well, we have a model uh, which we're working on you know, here in the state, but we're working to make sure we get all the right inputs into it. As I said, uh, the goal of a model would be to tell you what day are you going to run out of hospital capacity. And when we've got 99% of our hospital beds available for COVID patients, I'm in no rush to come out with a, a model because models get better with more data. So when we've got, uh, you know, we're a state that's only got, uh, you know, 100 and, 100 and some active cases. 
right? And so uh, we're, not, we're not talking about thousands and thousands of data points to put into a North Dakota model. Uh, models get better when they, got more, when they have more data points. So the longer we wait, the more information we have, the better the models are going to be. Uh, and right now we're, we've got so much lead time and we're already doing, we're already doing the preparatory work, uh, the rehearsals, if you will, the preliminary stuff. If we ever were to, it's not like we're waiting with we the tier three stuff. Some of that's already in prep, uh, but, but we are, uh, so I, I think I just, we got, we got time to deliver a better product. You know, there'd be nothing, there'd be no value to the public or to the healthcare organizations or anything for us to put out a model that's completely flawed. So more time is time on our side is a good thing. Uh, Lane, then Danny. Governor, when we get to the point that we can reopen some businesses like restaurants and bars, is there a plan in place on who can open first and how many people may be let in? Uh, there's not a specific plan built, but there's a team that's uh, started thinking about that. Uh, and again, just like we're trying to take all the best information from other states or other countries that have already been through this process, the same way will come with opening because just like we, the, the virus arrived here later, uh, it's going to probably leave here later. So we'll have an opportunity to look at other countries and how they're uh, working through their reopening. We'll be able to look at other states uh, in terms of when they're able to reopen. And that's, uh, so we'll be able to get some insight. But what I would, what I have said in other interviews is that people should not think of the reopening as the, as the, uh, the same way we closed. When we closed, it was pretty sudden, which is, hey, we're facing a pandemic uh, with a deadly virus. You know, we're shutting things down. Executive order, close. Uh, when on the way back up again, we're going to have to think about how do we open, open things up slowly so we don't end up, you know, creating a unforecasted spike because suddenly we're sort of quote back to normal. As I said, we won't have normal, we'll have back to the new normal. I would anticipate that when we start to open up again uh, for uh, places that have a lot of social activity like bars and restaurants, uh, when, when we open up, there will be limits uh, in terms of the, say, if, you, if you're rated for occupancy of 100 people, uh, when you open back up, you might say on you know day one, hey, you can have you know 25% or you can have 30% or 40% of your occupancy when you open up. Uh, like I've compared it to turning on a spigot, which is you know we shut it down hard, but when we open it up, we're gonna have to open it up slowly, and then see what see how see see what results from that. But absolutely, we're we're working on it and and thinking about it and again trying to get a separate team on the economic side on the commerce side that's working on that uh well from a health standpoint we're we got teams of people working around the clock to make sure that we keep people health and you know safe and healthy alan, question online alan burke with the emmons county record has uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine been used in north dakota with covid19 patients and if so is there any data on whether it's working uh, just when I get a question for a uh, state health officer, she stepped out, I think, to take a call. Uh, and, and so we'll have to get back to you on that one. Lane? We had a uh, viewer who was concerned that uh, the rent at their Section 8 housing was going to be raised because of property taxes going up, apparently. Uh, and they were wondering if that's legal to do right now with all that's going on. Uh, great question. I uh, can't connect the dots uh, on that one about property taxes uh, raising uh, Section 8 housing because Section 8 housing payments are related as a percentage of income. Uh, and it would be up to the property owner on whether they would pass that through. And I don't know of any, I mean, I'd have to know what cities because those property tax decisions are all made locally. I haven't heard of anybody that is raising taxes right now, but I would encourage that viewer maybe to reach out uh, to the uh, Erica Thunder, our labor commissioner, because uh, they deal with all the fair housing and housing issues, and they, they might be in a great position to be able to help them. Okay, going to take one more. Anybody here? One more online. Uh, Tom Simon with Williston Trending Topics. Uh, for students taking courses, uh, as high school students taking college courses, uh, is there any programs or options available or being considered for pay for parents who may already be stressed financially during this time? Uh, 
so Tom, trying to connect the dots on that one, is it a, or maybe Danny, is it related to the cost of the online course from a university, but you're a high school kid? Uh, that one I'd have to kick back to our, uh, to our North Dakota University system. I know that uh, there's a lot of courses that are offered through, uh, you know, dual credit or AP courses and online classes that you can take from our colleges even when you're in high school. Uh, and, but on the, the pricing side of that would be, uh, you know, driven by the university that's offering it. But if there's a specific there, Tom, you want to shoot us a note, we can, we can uh, pass that on to the, uh, the chancellor in the higher ed system. Okay, with that, uh, we're gonna, I think we're at the point where we're going to close. Uh, I do want to thank Lindsay again, who's got incredible stamina uh, through all of this. And yesterday, I think when we were talking about economic packages, and I had a chance to watch you, uh, I was trying to decide what's the signing is huge, different than gigantic, or are they the same symbol? I'm watching now to see is because there was something that was okay. There was something That's yesterday was same. okay. There's, Okay. All right. Good. Well, anyway, we're, uh, but anyway, thank you, Lindsay, for the great work you're doing. We continue to get lots of compliments all the time about the great work Lindsay does. And even last week, uh, a bouquet of flowers ended up in our office and they were for Lindsay uh, from one of her fans uh, watching online. So thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thank you, First Lady, uh, for all you do for the state of North Dakota and for the country. And again, thanks uh, to uh, everybody that's listening in. I want to give a shout out here at the end. Also, we get a lot of good input from legislators from around the state coming into our staff. I've had uh, regular calls with legislative leaders, had a chance to talk personally with Senator Rich Wardner and Representative Chet Pollard uh, today, uh, getting valuable information uh, from uh, from them on their regions of the state and what's going on. Lots of other uh, feedback from legislators. So appreciate uh, all the feedback and support that we're getting for mayors and county commissioners. Had a great call this morning. I think there was uh, over 1,600 people that were on a call uh, today with the uh, sponsored by uh, the Greater North Dakota Chamber. I want to thank them and Michelle Comer and Eric Hardmeyer and uh, all of the other electeds that were on there. Secretary of State uh, Jager, Ryan Rauschenberger, John Gottfried, uh, answering questions related to all of the, the moving parts and the new information about the economic side of things. So big, huge team effort, lots of people working on it. And uh, special thanks to uh, everybody over at the Unified Command. You don't see them here, but we got a team of people that are working over at Frayne Barrett. Uh, every day helping to manage this through emergency services uh, in addition to all the great work being done at the Department of Health and also a shout out uh, to the teeny staff in the governor's office uh, who does great work every day uh, you know managing all kinds of things but we're really fortunate to have such a great group of people that are so committed uh, to helping us get through the, both this high health crisis and this economic crisis and finally thank you to the media uh, because uh, this is uh, I'm talked to other governors we have to have uh, uh, the most competent and most polite media in the country right here in North Dakota. So thank you for being part of that. Uh, thanks for your good questions every day. Thanks for all the media that tunes in online and all their questions. And we will uh, see you uh, tomorrow, a good Friday, right here at 3.30.